CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on October 21st, 2024. I'm Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy, and joining me this evening, start with my right, Eric Helmuth, Select Board Member. John Hart. Leonard Jiggins. Jim Feeney. Michael Cunningham. Ashley Marr. And uh, Mrs. Mahan will not be joining us this evening. Tonight's meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with provisions in state law for remote participation in public meetings. Before we begin, please note the following. This meeting is being conducted in the select board chambers and over Zoom. It is being recorded and simultaneously broadcasted on ACMI. People wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. People participating either in person or by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, we ask you to provide your full name and place of residence in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials found on the town's website, specifically the select board agendas and minutes page. If technical difficulties sever the remote connection to one or more participants and efforts to reconnect within a reasonable period of time fail, the in-person meeting will continue at the discretion of the chair, provided that a quorum of the board is physically present. Zoom participants are encouraged to retain the phone number provided in their confirmation for a backup audio connection to the meeting. There will be two opportunities tonight for public comment. We will have our open forum, and agenda item nine is a public hearing for a national grid petition. If you're attending by Zoom and want to participate, please raise your hand when I announce that public comment is open. We have 16 agenda items this evening. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. And with that, I will move on to agenda item two, which is a presentation and a vote on a senior citizen means tested property tax exemption amount. Uh, our director of assessments, Dana Mann, will be making the presentation. And while he comes up, I, I note that there are two members of the Board of Assessors here this evening, Gordon Jamison and Bill Zagata. We welcome them as well. And uh, before Mr. Mann starts, I just want to give a little bit of background what he's going to be presenting this evening. We're actually going to see him twice this year. We're going to see him this evening. We're going to see him in early December when we uh, set the tax rate. But uh, this means tested exemption goes back to 2019 when town meeting approved a, um, a local senior uh, exemption. It needed approval through a home rule petition at the legislature. And last November, when we had our override vote, uh, this was question two. Uh, one of the requirements was voters had to approve it as well, and it, approved, it was approved by voters uh, by 84% uh, vote. So with that, a little bit of background. Welcome, Mr. Mann, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Steve, and uh, uh, thank you to the, the uh, select board and members of uh, town staff and uh, town manager. Um, Miss Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor sends apologies. She couldn't make it this evening. Um, but yes, uh, tonight we're, we're talking about uh, a vote on the amount to be a, a made available um, for the senior means tested exemption. This exemption is modeled after um, a state program, the uh, state circuit breaker tax credit. Um, the percentage that we'll be voting this evening is based on that, um, that uh, credit amount. Um, if we go right to slide one, I'd like to introduce the numbers around each of the options. Um, we can see that uh, the, the act that authorizes this uh, exemption uh, provides that the select board may choose an amount between 50 and 200 percent of that state uh, tax credit. Um, so the first number is the 
total amount of the exempted tax at that percentage. The next number is the average exemption that would be available at that amount. Uh, so I should introduce that we had uh, 34 applicants. Uh, 21 of them were approved and qualified for the exemption. Um, moving on, the third, fourth column there um, is the <clears throat> total amount of exempted value. Um, and that's important uh, because the act requires that this exemption be paid for or um, funded through um, only the residential class. Um, so the last column is the total um, value of the residential class. The way that uh, the the amounts are funded is by reducing the total value of the residential class while maintaining the same uh, tax levy on that class, on the residential class. So you can see here that we reduce the um, total value by the amount of the exempted value and uh, apply the same uh, tax levy to the residential class. Um, so if we move to the next slide, this is a form that um, is straight out of the Department of Revenue um, gateway uh, system, uh, where all of the town's tax, and all of Massachusetts town's tax information is, resides. In, uh, what I want to show here is um, the second line, the net of exempt amount. So that's that total residential value minus the amount of the exempted value. Um, and we can see in column E the results of the townwide tax levy. Um, creates a tax rate of $10.77 for each class of property, meaning a single tax rate. The important thing to note here is the bottom right-hand corner. That's the amount collected by way of those tax rates. Uh, so we can see that that $166,205,000 $617 um, is under our tax levy, which is the third uh, number down in the upper right-hand corner, the one, $166,280,494. Um, if we move on to option number two, which would be a 75% uh, of the um, state tax credit, the numbers change. And what they do is they increase the um, tax rate on the residential class by a penny. However, that penny is signif significant. Um, the commercial, industrial, and personal property Classes maintain that same $10.77 tax rate. Um, however, the total amount collected in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, $166,340,832, uh, $166, is larger than our levy. Um, this creates a problem with the Department of Revenue. We can't obviously collect more than our levy, um, which is restricted by Proposition 2 and a half. Um, what this means is that any amount over, it's actually about 52%, um, would puts us in jeopardy of collecting more funds than our levy will allow. Um, 
There are some options where you can introduce a, um, a tax shift in the classification hearing. However, none of those options, no shift option, will provide for a single tax rate. Um, are there any questions? I know that was a lot of yeah, information. No. Yeah, I, if, why don't you continue, and then we can we can ask members at the end. Unless is, is that the end of the presentation, or it is unless you have questions. Okay, all I right. Know. No, no, thank you. I uh, have a few more of the. You know, if you want to point out, it's on 100 percent is the next slide, then 150 percent. Sure, but the important part there is you'll notice that they all exceed the um, levy. Right, which, which we can't do. We can't go above the levy through the exemption process or, or else we'll run a file proposition two and a half. That's right. It, yeah. And it, it's, it's all around the um, percentage of um, each class. So our residential class represents 94% approximately um, of the levy um, commitment. And uh, the single penny on that class raises um, a significant amount of approximately one hundred and fifty two thousand dollars. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Hurd. So, just a question: so based on the presentation, is a recommendation of the board of assessors that we adopt the fifty percent? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Diggins, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, so to what extent are people? helped by the 50 percent option yeah so uh, interesting I, I thank you for that question the <clears throat> the state raised the maximum allowable exemption last year um, they they essentially doubled the amount of this exemption so when, when our statute was or act was written the maximum Exemption, exemption amount was $1,132. Uh, it was raised to $2,590. Um, so a significant change in the value of the exemption. Um, okay, so, all right, I, mean, I have a sense of what changed, but I'm trying to get a sense of to what benefit are people deriving from that because that will help determine, you know, be, if we feel good about the 50%, even if we can't do more than that, but we'll have a question later on. So do you have a sense of that? You can say no, I mean, I don't have a sense of. I think Mr. Feeney may have sure. a little more information so, on this. Mr. Diggins, if I could, you know, just to uh, build upon what Mr. Mann said, a 50% choice now equates to a what would have been a hundred percent benefit when we passed the act but with respect to what each individual receives it will be based on what they personally qualified for under the state's circuit breaker not everyone qualifies for that maximum so we'll be providing a 50 percent benefit for what they actually received uh, for their circuit breaker credit so that will be a sliding scale. On average, it would be somewhere just it's, just north of a thousand dollars. Right, one thousand forty-three dollars. Right. Well, this might be information that we can't get without doing a poll. I understand the nature of my question is a little bit. It's a challenging question, you know. I mean, so so thanks. Well, I would like to, um, if possible, discuss shift options, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, that may have some bearing on what we do in a few weeks, you know, unless something can be done retroactively. So. You bring it up. Have you, do you did you do any math? Oh, I see in the Britain in Britain the, any maths on this? <laughs> sure. So um, all of our information right now is um, is not certified by the DOR. So they're, they're subject to some slight changes. Um, but I, I I ran some numbers and. If you were to shift approximately um, seven one thousandths of a of a percent, you would change the industrial, commercial, and personal property 
to a tax rate of approximately $10.80. Um, and you would lower the tax rate on the residential class to that 1077. I see. But but I want to I want to stress that um, no amount of shift will create a single tax rate. So any shift would uh, create a um, multiple tax rate environment. Understood. Understood. You know. So the I do have one more question. Sure. Um, the so that's in the direction of making the industrial commercial higher, right? I mean, did you explore the other direction or is that just not even practical? It, it, it's not, uh, it would be very unique yeah. to, in this, to uh, shift from the, uh, the burden from the commercial industrial and personal property uh, to the residential class. In fact, the Department of Revenue calculator doesn't go that way. You'd have to do the math by hand. All right. All right. Well, I'll stop for now. You know, uh, maybe maybe something else because maybe Mr. Helmuth has something. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Um, had if we had more people who were applied and were approved. Would that change the calculus here in, in what the effective tax rate would be and what we could exempt? It would. So every year these numbers will be, sl will be different. Um, in talking with other uh, towns who have adopted similar exemptions, years, uh, year one is traditionally a, a, a lower um, application year applications will tend to rise over significantly over the next few years. So we anticipate that the number of, of applicants will rise each year. Um, so yes, as these numbers, as the number of applicants rises, um, the, the exemption numbers will rise and will have an effect each year, um, depending on the levy as well, uh, as part of that calculation. Um, <clears throat> so yes, it, it, it generally falls to where the penny uh, changes in the tax rate um, and the rounding that's used by the Department of Revenue. This, this makes me grateful for the professional expertise we have in yourself and the town manager and others. Uh, so please forgive my, my lack of that, of such. Uh, which direction would it change if we had double the people who were approved this year? Would that, um, I guess, tell me what the, which direction would be on the tax rate, but what I'm really interested in it was, would that change how much exemption we can grant? Would that lower it or, or raise it? Uh, so it could be either. Mm. So we may have less um, what's called... Um, uh, the difference between uh, which side of the penny the uh, levy falls on um, will change. Mm -hmm. And so there may be more room um, before the uh, penny, the rounding takes effect. Mm -hmm. So yes, every year it's going to be a little bit different. Good, thank you. Um, I should add to my, uh, my appreciation the Board of Assessors expertise as well because this is what you all do and uh, I'm grateful for it. Uh, my final question, I think, is um, just for the public's understanding and, and reminder to me uh, about the uh, conditions. I know that some of this is, of course, set by the state uh, circuit breaker. You know, it's means tested, so the, the state, you, know, you have to qualify for the state. Um, was there was there additional criteria that the, the assessors set for assets this year? There was. So, so can you, you know, remind me what that was? Thank you. The, um, the act that authorizes the exemption requires that the assessors determine an amount of, of assets mm -hmm. that would be a limit. Um, uh, to ensure that applicants met the criteria established by the, um, or, or indicated by the act. 
and, um, and, and you know, oh, go ahead. An amount was reviewed. In other words, we, we looked at what other towns had done. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked at our, our current um, exemptions that are on the books, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, the, and the board made a decision uh, that $250,000 um, was conservative for the first year. And that, it, am I right that that does not include the value of the principal home? That's right, But yes. it would include uh, some you know, cash that's maybe not available as a liquid asset to most people with like a retirement fund, 401k? It does. Yeah. Um, th thank you, I appreciate that. I think this is probably for a, f a future discussion, but one mental note I had, and based on some feedback from, from a couple of residents, I think sure. that there was a, as an awareness that I think conservative budgeting the first time you try something is wise, um, but that you know if many people because of how um, you know the, the transition that our country has taken from from uh, retirement uh, pensions to 401ks, for instance, and 403bs, that someone who is responsibly planning for themselves, even if they don't have much liquid, don't much income, and don't have any liquid assets, may have a lot more than that in their. 401k, and um, you know, I would be curious to see how a higher amount, if that seemed prudent, the board felt it was prudent, would affect eligibility and for some of the people who didn't apply because they weren't eligible. Sure. So we did, we did look at um, the results. Mm. So we had um, 21 people who qualified for the, uh, for the exemption. Um, the people who did not qualify Essentially, there were four um, categories that uh, caused a denial. Um, so we had 75% um, of the applicants were disqualified for some form of income or property value mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and that's set by the state? That, that, breaker, well, the, yeah. the, the assessment is, amount is set by the state, mm -hmm. um, and the income, that's right, the income requirements are also established statewide. Yep. Um, only one applicant was denied due to the, their assets. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Um, good. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate those answers, and I appreciate very much the work that, that you and the assessors have done to implement this the first time, I think it's it's a good start, and I hope that we're able to to do some work and maybe catch a luckier break next time to grant more of an exemption. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank thank you, Mr. Helmuth. I just have a few comments. Um, I had met previously with Mr. Mann, and he'd reviewed some things with me. And, and you've already gone through their income limits. There was a, a limit on the, the property assessment for fiscal 24 couldn't exceed a million 25, and then there was some issues just the relationship between this local exemption and the state senior um, exemption, the circuit breaker exemption. And, and one of the things, if you could just maybe elaborate a little bit in an in, in area where we really have to be careful going forward for individuals is you don't, by receiving this exemption, you don't want to perhaps jeopardize your ability to receive the senior circuit breaker exemption, which is more valuable to an individual. If you could talk about that a little sure. bit. And just a further challenge of this local exemption. So, so um, everything has, or a lot of things, uh, attempts to um, uh, do good things uh, have unintended consequences. And this exemption, one of the unintended consequences is people who receive the exemption um, change their, their ratio of um, taxes paid to income, which is how they test for the, the means tested. Um, so every amount that you reduce from their taxes is less taxes paid, which may disqualify or reduce someone's exemption amount from, or tax credit at the state level. Subsequently, um, their qualifications for the town exemption. Okay, thank, thank you, and, and, and just a comment. We're in, this is the first year we can do this, as, as has been said. This was something that was proposed several years ago. I think it started in Sudbury and Concord, and, and there was actually a bill statewide that was unsuccessful. 
and I think as we're going through this, we're seeing this year based on your presentation and we'll learn more when you come before us in December, but there are limits in terms of what the benefit could be this year. And it's, it's it, when you roll out a program, you don't exactly know where it's gonna go and, and you learn from the first year and, and maybe improve it. And, and there are some other things too, maybe to be looked at next year on how this is funded, whether it's funded within the residential class by a, a shift within the class itself, or whether it's done from the overlay account. And, and that's, I'm not gonna get into those specifics now, but there's a, there's a lot that uh, goes into this. I think that the most important thing that I see here is one, at the end of the day, we can't go above our levy limit, and that's, that's the, the, the issue with the 50%. Two, we don't want to put residents in a situation where they will not be not qualify in future years, and, and that goes to all the work you've done in your office and talking to people, putting out the detailed information guide um, for residents. And, and I think that the third thing is, as this gets rolled out and more people know about it, um, more people will probably apply for it. And, and for this year, assuming the board goes with the 50%, that's $21,000 of relief for individuals that we're giving. And I think that's just less than half what the, the circuit breaker is giving people this year, roughly. Is that, is, I think that was a number. Yes, it is. And, and, and not, uh, that would be a tax credit on yeah, the state right. side, right? This is a, a direct exemption. Um, from the right on the tax bill as opposed to on the individual's income tax return. That's correct. Yeah, okay. All right, Th thank you, Mr. Mann. So, Mr. Hurd asked a question about the recommendation for 50%. I don't think I received any motions yet. So, if anybody is so inclined, I'll take a motion. Move approval at 50%. I'll second that. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd for approval at 50%, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. All in favor say aye. 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 Great, thank you. We look forward to seeing you in December. Sure. Thank yeah. you. I, I will be back in a few weeks. Um, <laughs> and thank you very much for your time. Sure. Okay, item three is a presentation on the lead service line inventory. Uh, Michael Rademacher, our Director of Public Works, will be making the presentation. Good evening, Mr. Rademacher. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, thank you for this time to um, present on not only the lead uh, service line inventory, but work that the town has been doing to um, identify and, and remove lead prior to the requirement from the DEP. So in 2021, the uh, EPA announced revisions to the to their lead program, uh, which would require in the coming years all communities in the country to submit an inventory of their uh, water service lines uh, in their corresponding state to their corresponding DPs or, or so forth and so on. Um, and so that was in 2021. Uh, prior to that, the town had been doing a significant amount of work already to identify what our service lines are and how much lead is in our system. Uh, in 2015, we began a program of replacing water meters in, um, in the majority of homes in Arlington. And one of the components of that work was to identify in visually an inspection while that meter was being replaced, what um, material was witnessed. And in addition, we were also uh, scouring historic documents to try to also uh, get a better understanding of what our population of water service materials were in the town. So in 2019, based on our first round of water meter uh, inspections and the data we were able to um, get from records reviews, we were able to identify about 7,500 service line materials out of a population of about 12,750. And of that 7,500, we found a potential 69 lead services, both from records and some IDs. Uh, as we got into those 69 locations, we were able to confirm that only 10 were actually led by the time we got to them, and we've replaced all but two of those um, as of this spring in 2024. Um, and then as we were further preparing for this, the, the submission of our inventory, which was um, due last week, and, and we submitted it, uh, we, we scoured another 1,500 or so records and found another 24 uh, potential lead service lines based on um, 
again, records review, historical records reviews. And so we will be further evaluating those locations in the coming months to determine how many are actually still led and prepare to replace those as well. Uh, so between uh, those two efforts, we've identified approximately 9,000 of our 12,750 um, lead ser um, service lines in the town of Arlington. So we still have uh, about 3,500 what are considered unknowns um, that will require further effort to identify. Uh, so we have a few, a few options at our disposal. Uh, we will be rolling out next week a, an interactive map of all um, service lines in town, whether they're known or unknown, residents will be able to um, navigate that system. And if it's unknown, we're asking that uh, residents self-identify. We'll give tools to how you can identify what your service line material is in your basement and report that through an online portal. Uh, we will also um, be making appointments if folks have trouble doing that or they need assistance. We'll have an option that the DPW will come out and help evaluate service line. Um, we will also um, be contracting in the coming years with a vendor who can actually make small excavations in the, in not necessarily in the street, but probably in the sidewalk where the um, valve is for control of water. And that way you can see the material on either side of the, either under the street or on private property, and we'll be making records of those. And, um, and any lead observed through those processes will obviously be um, recorded, and um, we'll reach out to residents with the proper um, process for having that removed. Currently, the town has a program where we're, we're funding that removal. We're taking care of that 100% um, through ARPA funds. Mm. And it's been very successful to date. So we do, like I say, we still have 3,500 unknowns. And as part of the inventory process, we are going to be required to submit letters um, to those locations. And those will be going in the mail in the next few weeks. So anyone who has an unknown or lead, and there's another category, it's not as um, prevalent, but uh, galvanized. There are some galvanized pipe that if it was ever installed in conjunction with the lead pipe, it's considered um, needs to be replaced. Particles of lead can get stuck in the galvanized lead uh, in the galvanized pipe, and so the EPA and the DP require that that pipe be removed as well. So we are inventorying lead, galvanized, and uh, the unknowns need to be identified. <coughs> so um, as I mentioned, we submitted our first initial uh, inventory last week on the 16th. There's a copy of that at Public Works that is publicly available but um, we're anticipating next week for an interactive map, a uh, much more, eas more easily navigable um, database for residents and also um, property owners to uh, see what they have at their property. So that was due last uh, 16th. By November 15th, we're required to have those uh, notification letters submitted, and, and those are in process right now, and we expect to meet that deadline. And then in three years from now, the uh, EPA and the DEP will, will be expecting some um, changes to the inventory. They're, they're looking at some other materials or some other elements that they're going to want to include. And, and, that'll, and that'll, that whole process will conclude in three years from now. And at that point, all communities will have a baseline inventory that then triggers a 10-year period where everything has to be either identified and, if let or galvanized, replaced. So that's the timeline that the the uh, DEP and the federal government are giving communities. And um, we will um, obviously be working towards m m meeting or exceeding that goal. Great. Th th thank you, Mr. Ronemarker. Just one point of clarification. You'd mentioned ARPA funds being available. That's available for the individual's uh, service lines as well, as, or is it the town's replacement? No, the town is replacing um, both. OK, yep. OK, with, with those funds. OK, great. Yep. Um, I appreciate that. So I will um, turn it to board members for any questions or comments. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Rodemacher. This is an excellent presentation and an excellent program. Um, so I'm correct that the service line is the connection from the, from the uh, property structure to the street or to the, to the main in the street? Uh, yes, the service line is, yes, from the town's main in the street to the home. And it's often considered, there's often referred to as public and private sections of the service line. 
the public section is from the main to basically the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And the town mm -hmm. owns that infrastructure. And from the sidewalk to the property, which is typically on private property, mm -hmm. is considered the private portion of a service line. Gotcha. Um, and what, what is the ma typical material and no materials for the mains themselves? Uh, in, in the town of Arlington, we have uh, ductile iron, cast iron. We have a material called transite, which is also referred to as asbestos cement pipe. Uh, and, and those are typically the three main materials that but, we have. But not lead? For, not for main transmission okay. lines, no. Okay. no. Um, great. And um, for, for homeowners who, you know, who may you know, be listening to this and, and be concerned about lead until they get it um, replaced, which is obviously the right thing to do, um, does any aspect of, of the MWRA's treatment uh, that would alter pH or other aspects of the water mitigate the, the exposure to lead? There is, yes. The MWRA treats uh, all drinking water with um, compounds that prevent the lead from or significantly reduces the uh, lead from leaching into uh, water. And we as a community, as well as all of the communities, are required to annually test our most vulnerable properties. Uh, so we take samples from homes that we believe may have lead or may have um, pipes that have lead solder. And um, so we, mo we monitor the water, the quality of the water drinking through that program to make sure that that treatment is working. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hillman. Uh, Mr. Hurd? In, <clears throat> so we have a program that if, we, if a house identifies lead, that the town will help with the cost of the actual main Correct. water line main replacement? Yes. And is there a, a limitation on, you know, by what time someone, for how much longer that goes? Is it based on the availability of funds or is it just timing? So uh, right now we, we, we have not expended all the funds in that program um, because, like I said, when we first started out that first round, we thought we would have close to 69. And as we did more investigation, it came to be 10. Yep. So we had more money. So we're planning on... Um, encumbering that money and rolling it forward in the future years. And um, again, based on our track record to date where we have not had too many of these, yep. I expect that we will be able to continue funding this in, until we remove the lead lines and we would not have a time limitation on that assistance. Okay. I was just going to say incentivize yes. residents to go in and take a look if they know that if they have lead, they can replace the, the town will help replace the line it's sure. definitely better to get it done sooner than later um, sure. but we don't want to, we'd also don't want people to be out of luck if we don't get to them sooner okay thank you thank you mr hurd no go go right ahead um, thank you just just to follow to mr hurd uh, so this is part of the funding of this is from arpa funds currently arpa funds are helping us with this yes and do we have a a, a, a problem with the deadline to uh, and this might be a question for the town manager um to to obligate those funds before we, the end of the year we um the contract we currently have will be um running out so we expect to put another contract on the street so that we can um we can obligate funds for next year as well. Perfect. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Yeah, and I just want to note in, in your memo, um, and this will be available next week, as you said, at www.arlingtonma.gov backslash water. And I imagine there'll be an announcement on the, the town, maybe the front page of the town's website for people to visit that. Mr. Feeney's nodding his head on, on that. So I, I, I'm expecting I, a flood of traffic to the yeah, website. Yeah. Oh, it, 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 <laughs> I'm actually pretty interested in this. Hopefully the interest dries up quickly. And <laughs> uh, but we appreciate this, and, and this is very important, as, as, as we know, with, with the replacement of lead pipes. And, and um, as residents know, or you've reported to us when you come before us to talk about water rates, there is extensive testing that is done at the town's water supply, and, and there are various issues if they were at least in the town supply would be located but this is in the individual home so very important to, to to keep up with that so i appreciate the presentation all the work that you've done in complying both with state and federal uh, regulations here and um we'll see see what happens and we'll encourage people to to step forward because there are benefits for them yes. to replace this great yes thank yes. you thank you thanks mike thanks. okay uh Next, item four for approval, request 
for our special one-day beer and wine license on November 15th, 2024, and December 20th, 2024, at the Mill Cafe um, for Mill Cafe After Hours event. And Andrew Hunter from the Mill Cafe is here this evening. Good evening, Mr. Hunter. Good evening. Um, yeah, if you could just tell us about what's being planned and, and uh, the, the, the application. and uh, Happily, yeah. It's, uh, it's also just like a fun time to update from the last time that we met on December 4th. With the, when you approved the Mill Cafe, um, we're now open five days a week, and it's been really kind of amazing. Uh, we've made a lot of space for people to come and gather and connect, and been, been hosting events where moms meet each other and dads bring their sons for donuts and dads, and we've been able to support nonprofit work that's locally founded, and it's been pretty, really exciting. Uh, and this is just kind of like an extension of that, right? Where we're, we're trying to think about how do we use this space well, where there are a whole bunch of people that are not available during our normal work hours, which are from 7.30 to 4.30, and a lot of people would like to come in. And so we also liked the Arlington Brewing Company, um, uh, and so we thought oh, this would be a really fun thing to have them come do a pop-up, we could get some live music, and it would just be a community event that people could come into. Um, and we would continue to support our nonprofits through the, through the funds that we would raise by selling. We're going to do, uh, like, waffles, and uh, we're going to do savory waffles to go with the beers, which are our sweet waffles, which you normally do in our morning. We're going to do, like, cornbread waffles with fried chicken, and, uh, and then another friend of mine uh, does, um, like, the scallion pancakes, and she's Korean, so she does Korean chicken, so we're going to go back-to-back -back on that, where she's going to do scallion waffles, and... Uh, Korean chicken, and then we're going to sell great beer on the other side of the room, and it should just be a lot of fun. So we're just trying it out. We were hoping to do three, but now we're going to do two this year if, you, if we get approval, and um, and then we'll, we'll kind of like assess from there. Does this make sense for Arlington Brewing Company? Does it make sense for the mill? Is there a good group of people? Does it have a good vibe to it? And uh, is it good for the community? I hope it is. Uh, so okay. is that sufficient. Yeah, yeah I, and I think there'll be questions, but thank you for, 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 for that background. And, and again, just we've had different requests during the year. Arlington Brewing Company has been before us several times, and this is a special one-day license um, pursuant to Chapter 138, Section 14. Again, for the public, we are the local licensing authority for special one-day licenses. Now, um, one of the things that happens, and this is per regulations from the ABCC, Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission, is anything that we approve gets sent to the ABCC for their review. And, okay. and, um, and so one thing, and this is just on your application, um, I know when we had the common victuallers license, the High Rock Church was the applicant here. You're listing just the Mill Cafe. Mill Cafe is a DBA, I, I, I know, not a separate organization. So you're here on behalf of the church for the for the um, Absolutely. For the I work for the church. Yeah. Um, and I just put the DBA because it was clarifying for what yeah. part of the church was going to do that, but absolutely. Okay. Yes. And, and, With and full think, knowledge of our board. Sure. Okay. And I think maybe just for purposes of the application, the approval, we probably should add that because you... In one of the questions you're asked, are you a not-for-profit? And, and the answer is yes, but again, Mill Cafe see. isn't churches. And so that's, we don't want to be in a situation where they're coming back to review things and say, wait a minute, we looked up Mill Cafe, it doesn't exist. It's the Secretary of State's office. And, and so um, I, th I think that's important. Just a question again, this goes to the, the statutory requirements on a, on a special one-day license for a not-for-profit. The, the statute actually allows a not-for-profit charitable organization to receive a donation from the entity that's that's selling the alcohol or, or that you're selling it. I'm just wondering if that's the arrangement here because we just have to take that into account as part of our approval. Um, we have not uh, built into the contract that they'll make a donation to High Rock or the Mill Cafe. Okay, so, so that, this. yeah, okay. Um, one of our partners is Foodlink right around the corner, and so our discussion is actually that we would give a percentage of all of our sales to Foodlink just as like a, uh, as we come into Thanksgiving, like it just makes sense. Yeah. Um, we haven't actually pinned that down, but there will be nothing that comes directly to High Rock or to the Mill Cafe. Okay, and then again, before I turn to members, one other item, and again, just because of the location of the Mill totally. Cafe, I want to um, turn it over to Attorney Cunningham because there is a finding that we would need to make 
because of your location of the cafe relative to the church. And so, Attorney Cunningham, if you could just enlighten the board on, on that requirement. It, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the board, the, as a local licensing authority, can grant this one-day license under Chapter 138, Section 14. However, because of its proximity to a church, um, it also, the board also needs to consider Chapter 138, Section 16C, 16 which requires a finding by this board um, that the premises located within a radius of 500 feet of a school or church should not be licensed for the sale of alcoholic beverages unless the local licensing authority determines in writing and after hearing that the premises are not detrimental to the educational and spiritual activities of said church or, or school. So the board can make that finding in conjunction with its consideration of the section 14 application. Um, I did look at the, some, for some guidance about how that distance is measured. It's measured from um, a straight line from the nearest point of the church or school to the nearest point of the premises to be licensed as outlined in ABCC Regulation 204 CMR 2.11. Um, pursuant to a quick map I did, it's approximately 321 feet from the, from the location, so it's within that 500 foot radius. So just if the board would, would like to grant the one day license, just need to make a, uh, we can make a finding that it is not detrimental to the purpose under, sec, under 16C. And, and again, that's just a question for you, Mr. Hunter. You've done this yep. with the full approval of the, the board of the church. There's no services behind the cafe on Friday evening or... Okay. It won't be detrimental to the work of High yep. Rock. Okay, okay. Now with that, I'll turn to board members for any questions, comments, motions? Anyone? Move we'll approval. <laughs> uh, okay, motion by Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Helmuth? Uh, you, you had me at savory waffles, but uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll second that. And, and I appreciate the careful explanation. I appreciate the chair's clarifications. I think that both of his points ended up being linked in that, you know, it's, it's beneficial that, that to the application that the ch church be on it, but it also helps clarify the point that the church does not believe that there's any problem with it as well. That's right. um, so good luck with the event. I'm glad to hear that the cafe is doing well. By the way, I was hoping that you would give an update, so I'm yeah. pleased to hear that, and I hope this is a success. Thank you. We've been able to employ uh, eight out of ten of our employees have disability, and that's just been really great. We were about to hire two more students from the high school. Um, and so that like, side of our what we're trying to do has just been uh, above and beyond what I expected. That's great. So, thanks. Great. Thank you. Well, Mr. Hardy? And I should ask Attorney Cunningham if we need any specific language in the approval regarding the finding. Yes, Mr. Hurd. Um, I would recommend that the a formal motion that the board determines that um, the premises are not detrimental to the educational and spiritual activities of said school or church. I'll amend my motion to approve to include the language <laughs> described by Attorney Cunningham. And Sorry, right, fine with that. Second. Fine with that. Yes, thank you. Any <laughs> further questions, comments? No, just to say that it, it seems from what I'm hearing, Pete, that you really are a great asset to the community. I mean, and so there's lots of <laughs> civic engagement happening there. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Okay, so on a motion for approval by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, good luck with the event. Great. So Thank you both. For two nights. Thank you all. And just so you know, we will change that administratively to add the church to the application. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next is the consent agenda. This is items five through eight. Item five, minutes of meeting September 23, 2024, and October 7, 2024. Item six are reappointments to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont, Elaine Hoffman, and Venkat Hol Holy. Um, item seven, a request for a contractor drain layer license from the Italian Touch. And item eight for approval, Arlington Open Studios lawn signs through November 9th, 2024. Turn to the board. Move approval. Okay. We have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Diggins. Any further discussion? We have a motion for approval by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. It is approved. Okay, next is item nine, a public hearing for National Grid Petition on Oakland Avenue. I will be recusing myself from this uh, petition and discussion uh, due to uh, work I do for National Grid. Um, so I will turn it over to Mr. Hurd. I assume Attorney Cunningham, there's no spe special significance to the middle chair, is there? <laughs> there is not, Mr. Hurd. 
feel free to move. If you... All right. Item number nine, we have a public hearing from National Grid. Uh, we have Mary Mulroney from National Grid. Yes, good evening. Good How evening, Ms. Mulroney. If you could just tell us about your application tonight. Um, National Grid respectfully requests your consent um, due to the paving um, by the town of Arlington. The National Grid recommends the replacement of approximately 25 feet of four inch plastic dating back to 2018, 305 feet of four inch cast iron dating back to 1926, 150 feet of four inch cast iron dating back to 1959, and 85 feet of four inch BS steel dating back to 1954, and 355 feet of four inch cast iron dating back to 1914. Gas main in Oakland Ave, from Wachusett Ave to just short of Park Ave and replacing it with 1,035 feet of six inch plastic. Then there'd be approximately 45 feet of four inch cast iron being replaced um, dating 1908 at the intersection of Oakland Ave and Claremont Ave, putting in 45 feet of six inch plastic and then approximately 70 feet of four inch cast iron dating back to 1910, gas main in the intersection of Oakland Ave and Hillside Ave with 70 feet of six inch plastic. Thank you, and we have your reference materials here to support the request. I will turn to the board for any questions or comments or motions. Mr. Diggins. I have a motion to approve. We have a motion approved by Mr. Diggins. Second. Seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Any further discussion? And we have Attorney Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, just this is a public hearing. Yep. It's been a while. I'm a little rusty. This is a public hearing. Any members of the public wish to speak on this application? And, or if you are in Zoom, please raise your hand in the Zoom function right now. Seeing no hands raised. Seeing none, we will close the public portion of this hearing. And we have a motion to approve by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And I am an aye. That is a 3-0 vote with one recusal. Thank you, Ms. Mulroney. You're all set. Thank you very much for your time, and have a good evening. A lot of plumbing discussions today. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. The last time I had to leave, I think I was gone for about an hour. So that's just, it's, it's, it's on average, it's quite reasonable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very reasonable. Okay, so uh, item 10 under appointments Arlington Commission of Arts and Culture, Ann Thompson, for a term to expire June 30th, 2027. Uh, is Ms. Thompson with us uh, through Zoom? Yes, she'll be joining us now. <coughs> Good evening, Ms. Thompson. Hello. Hi. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, why you're interested in serving on the uh, Commission of Arts and Culture. Yes. Um, so I'm Ann Thompson. Um, I have lived in Arlington with my family for about 13 years now. Um, and I'm the Associate Director with the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I've had that job for about two years. So I have a sort of long, um, many, many years of experience with marketing and event management. Um, so I was really excited to join the chamber and sort of com combine my marketing skills with, um, you know, a community engagement. So, um, and just being part of the arts community um, in Arlington was really appealing to me. It's just such a vibrant community. Um, so I'm really excited about the opportunity to um, join the ACAC. Um, and we just have so many events coming up, so many even in the next um, six weeks with Trick or Treat happening this Friday and the First Lights. Um, so many opportunities for wonderful art and music. So I'm excited to get involved with that. Thank you very much for your, your willingness to serve and for your volunteer experience to date. 
uh, in the town between Arlington Eats, the Bishop PTO, and the uh, Arlington Family Connection. So I will turn to board members. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I'd like to make a motion to approve and to say, uh, with the wonderful work that you've done with the Chamber of Commerce, we expect a lot from you, you know, so, <laughs> so, so um, and, and, um, and also you have like a big crew of, of um, grant writers be it, at ACAC, I mean, they're quite the, quite the bunch. Be it, so so um, uh, just keep powering on and keep doing the great work you, you all are doing. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Well, uh, second. Okay, second by Mr. Hurd, any other comment? Okay, so on a motion for approval by uh, Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Hurd, all in favor say aye. 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 Great, congratulations and, and thank you again. Thank you so much. Next, uh, item 11, licenses and permits for approval, common vitular license, um, Ajit Chada, uh, come on up, um, North Ender Italian Kitchen, 1345 Mass Ave. Yes, good sir. evening. Did I say your name properly? Ajit Chada, yeah. Okay, good. You're perfect. Great. Okay, yeah, no, if you could just tell us, uh, I know that business is, has been up and running. I think this might be a timing issue on the transfer of, right. of the license, but if you could tell us a little bit about it and uh, if there's any questions from the board. Sure, sir. <clears throat> As my name is Ajit Chowda. We currently took over this business this year, and uh, it's like uh, uh, this business is established like 10 years before somewhere, and then we took in uh, March 2024 this year. And uh, here we are applying for the permit uh, on uh, my name, and uh, he's Samir Jaji is my operation manager who's running the store evening, right now. Everybody. Good evening. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for coming this evening. I'll turn to board members for any questions or motions. Yeah. Move approval. Okay. Uh, Mr. Diggins? Second. Okay. Um, nothing further. Okay, so on a motion for approval by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. 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 Best of luck. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I wondered if that would return. <laughs> yeah. uh, now open forum. Uh, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Uh, there don't see anybody in the chambers here this evening on open forum. Uh, is there anybody on Zoom who wishes to be heard? Seeing no hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Ms. Marr. That concludes open forum for this evening. Um, next, under traffic rules and orders, other business, item 12, authorization of future Blue Bikes contract exceeding three years. John Alessi, Senior Transportation Planner, I believe Mr. Alessi is joining us uh, by Zoom. Good evening, Mr. Lessie. Good evening, select board members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is John Alessi. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner in the Department of Planning and Community Development. And I'm before you this evening to request that the board authorize a future contract with the operator of Blue Bikes for a period exceeding three years, as required by Section 12 of Chapter 30B of the General Laws. So to provide you with some background, the town's existing contract with the operator of Blue Bikes Lift will expire in 2026, and the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, MAPC, will be releasing an RFP on behalf of all the Blue Bikes municipalities, including Arlington, to select a new operator in 2025. So it's the intention of MAPC and all the represented municipalities to enter into a contract of five years with two two-year options to renew with the future operator. The purpose of this is to incentivize the future vendor to provide, or operator, to provide a higher level of service to users and to help secure more funding from the, type, from the system's title sponsorship, um, which is currently Blue Cross Blue Shield, so that we can continue growing the system throughout the region. So the select board may authorize the full anticipated contract length, which could be between five to nine years with those renewals, but the board still has the discretion under Chapter 30B, Section 12 to authorize a different contract duration. Um, however, in order for MAPC to move forward with the RFP process on behalf of the municipalities, the select board's authorization of a future contract exceeding three years is needed and requested this evening. 
So thank you for considering this request. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about the blue bike system, the procurement process. And I know that our town council would be happy to provide any background on the legal aspects of this authorization, authorization request. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Lessey. And, and I just want to clarify with Attorney Cunningham, this authorization would re require a majority vote of the board. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank I you. Yeah, just to go, go ahead. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to note that, as Mr. Lessey noted, uh, pursuant to Chapter 30B, Section 12B, because this is a pro proposed contract of longer than three years, this board's uh, approval is required. However, if the town were to choose to not enter that contract, they need not to do that. Uh, so this board can grant that authorization, which is then to be used by the uh, town's discretion, specifically the town manager. Thank, thank you, Attorney Cunningham. Okay, I'll turn to the board for any questions. And Mr. Hurd. So my similar question to a few items ago, since we rely on the expertise of our town staff, is there a recommendation for the, the period that we should, that would be in the best interest of the town? A, sp a specific recommendation? Um, Mr. Lessey? Or my, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding the request. Well, before actually, before you answer, maybe, I mean, right now it looks like at least a five year term, but the extensions, I don't know if that, uh, Attorney Cunningham, if that would be part of the vote as well on the authorization. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, it would. So the the action by that I think Mr. Lessey is requesting is for the five year term, but also for the subsequent two two-year extension, so an authorization for a total of nine years. Again, the town need not exercise those options, but it, it does need to get this board's approval before it would have that opportunity. And I can also add that the purpose of doing a future contract more than three years, it just helps incentivize a future vendor to kind of spend more time investing in the system. As I said, if there's a shorter contract duration, you know, an operator might not have as much incentive. That's why we want to give them a longer time period so that they know that the investments they're making are going to be worth it to support the overall bike share system. Thank, thank you, Mr. Lessie. Uh, Mr. Diggins? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I am very much inclined to make a motion to approve you know, the request be for five years plus the two uh, two year options. You know, he, as you might imagine, Mr. Alessi, I have a bunch of curiosity questions on this one. You know, can I go to the MAP website maybe and find out more? Or do you have more information about like the background on this? I mean, like why we're looking for another venue vendor and other elements that might go into uh, the future contract? Yeah, I can just answer that here, Mr. Diggins. So. Uh, this information isn't posted online, but well, one, we're going through an RFP process just because the, our existing contract with Lyft is ending in 2026. And the intention of all the Blue Bikes municipalities is to get the most efficient operator of the system. So the current operator Lyft is likely to submit a proposal for the RFP to continue operating the system. But say that there's another operator out there that thinks that they could do the, um, that could operate the system at a lower cost. We want to provide that opportunity for another potential operator to put in a bid so that we can create a better value for the blue bike system while maintaining it and growing it in the future. Okay, thank you. Is it Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helms? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very happy to second that. I do have a, a question that I hope is reasonably material uh, to the topic and to the vote. Uh, since the, that the, the town and, and the, the coalition will be, the compact will be uh, entering into a new contract, is there any discussion about requesting in the RFPs uh, service, uh, a service that would provide uh, helmet rental along with the blue bikes. And, and I guess the broader question would be, is that even feasible in other markets that do, that do these kind of bike rentals? Mm. That's a good question, Mr. Helmuth. I think I've been taking part in this working group to go over what we'd like to be included in the RFP. We haven't brought this topic up yet. I think that within bike share systems, it's a little bit difficult to have the infrastructure available to do helmet rentals. I've seen in other markets, you know, in European countries where they have these bike helmet vending machines, but obviously those have to be inside. So I think with the current model we have, 
of stations being located outdoors, it might not really be feasible. I've also seen some examples of kind of foldable collapsible helmets, but I just don't know if we have the infrastructure at this time to kind of set up a system like that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that, that was my expectation. I think I would encourage you and the others to continue looking at that. I think perhaps for the future um, for a safe, uh, safety issue. And I think it is an alternative to that since the infrastructure, I mean, there's obviously some, some public health and safety implications to reusing helmets and, and, and providing them, as you say, the vending machines. But uh, another ancillary uh, issue with that is the, the, the degree to which the vendor and the operations can strongly encourage people to bring their own helmets. Um, and, you know, and, and maybe, and again, this is just a suggestion to explore this, um, certainly not material to the, to the contract vote. Uh, but you know, I, 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 I would appreciate a continued um, focus on that to make sure that the vendors are doing what they can to encourage people to protect their brains. Um, yes, I can, we can definitely um, increase the marketing as part of the current marketing, we can do that. And also in the future procurement, I know that the Globe recently came out with an article talking about bike share and how it's kind of related to increased, um, you know, crashes that have happened, so that's something that's definitely on our radar. Yeah, it was that article that prompted my question, actually. Um, and <laughs> just as a, as a further thought, you know, we have some wonder, we have a great bike shop or two in town um, and some ones nearby, so, you know, maybe there's, there's some partnership opportunities with, with promotion and, you know, if there could be a source of grant funding that would, um, that would allow for a discounted purchase, for instance, that could be really interesting to think about in conjunction with the marketing of these. Because uh, I, I love seeing the blue bikes on the path for lots of reasons. It's a public health benefit. It's good for the environment. Um, but um, you know, I, I worry how many people I see uh, going going with uh, without helmets. Even even on the bike path, it's it's crowded and um, everyone's careful. But you know, it doesn't take much of a fall to do some damage. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, sir. But for the public, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth, and, and uh, Mr. Ellis. Just a couple questions, expanding on. Um, Mr. Diggins' question. I, I took your use of the language, a new operator, wasn't necessarily that it couldn't be Lyft. I think you've said that, but this isn't a situation where we're ready to move on from If Lyft is competitive in the next contract, um, the communities would be happy to have them again. Is that fair to say? Or Yeah, absolutely. OK. And, and, and just, you know, we had line bikes here years ago. I don't even know if they're are there any other competitors right now out in the marketplace? In terms of, so, to, so Lime Bikes was different in that it was, all of the equipment was owned by Lime, whereas Blue Bikes is different in that we own all of the equipment. We own the bikes, we own the stations. So, you know, if Lyft decides not to be the operator, they're not going to take all these stations with them. Like, we own it. So we're simply just paying for another operator. So in terms of other operators, there are some out there. I know that, you know, in, um, in Northampton, there's another smaller operator out there. I forget the name though. So there are options out there. Uh, the group of municipalities, including myself, actually developed a request for information, kind of putting out some, some feelers to see if there were other potential operators who were interested. And I think we got six responses, not including Lyft. So we definitely think that there's more of a competitive market out there. Good. Well, that's, that, that, that's good to hear. And just a question on the contract where it's potential, because we don't know until you get your bids in, but what has been discussed here, is this just bikes or could this potentially include scooters? And I'm just wondering to the extent that, that there's a particular proposal that not every community would be willing to go along with, is, is this all or nothing in terms of what the next, in terms of your discussions? And again, I don't want to get into individual specifics, but was it envisioned that it would be one contract that would apply to every community that wants to participate if they if they opt in? Yeah. So to answer your first question, I don't think that scooters are on the table right now. I think it's just I think we're focusing this as bike share. And to answer your second question, it, it's still it's still an open question whether or not we can have individual contracts or if we want to have a single one. That's really up. We still need to have those conversations amongst all the municipalities that make up the system. And we actually have a group meeting tomorrow with all the, with MAPC and the municipalities where I'm sure that we're gonna discuss that as a group. Great, okay.
Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Lessie. Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, appreciate the presentation this evening and, and, and for answering our questions. So on a vote to approve authorization, uh, motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, so there's the authorization. Good luck with your discussions. Thank you very much. Okay, item 13, discussion and approval, town manager evaluation process, James Feeney, town manager. I'll turn it over to Mr. Feeney. He's provided us with some dates. This is further to the discussion we had a couple meetings ago on a, on a timeline for the evaluation process. Mr. Feeney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And first, please permit me to apologize. I'm seeing now there was a typographical error in the memo provided about my evaluation. How embarrassing uh, <laughs> that, you know, this process would start with a narrative self-evaluation provided sort of uh, in a letter format, which will be distributed to board members uh, via email today. Uh, and then between today, October 21st, and November 15th, uh, board members would complete the evaluation instrument that accompanied uh, the memo provided this evening and transmit it to the chair on or before November 15th. Uh, the following week, uh, between November 18th and then through December 2nd, uh, select board chair would work along with the human resources director to compile uh, scores from the respective individual evaluation instruments and create one comprehensive evaluation document. Uh, that would be available on December 2nd to be posted with board materials for uh, public discussion at our regularly scheduled meeting on December 4th, 2024. Great. Thank, thank you, Mr. Feeney. Um, questions? Motions from the board? Uh, Mr. Helmuth? Looks great to me. I appreciate the explanation, and I'd like to move uh, approval. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Second. Okay. Any further? Uh, Mr. Diggins. Um, so, Mr. Feeney, can we get the uh, our evaluation in a different format so that we can enter in the information electronically? Because I, I could convert the PDF to a Word document, but it gets a little funky, you know? I would be able to disseminate that as a Word document. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, okay, um, I don't have anything further. Appreciate the, the, the laying out the dates here, Mr. Feeney, and, and uh, I will be working uh, with Ms. Malloy on, on the uh, process as we go forward. So in a motion for approval by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Now correspondence received. I'll do each one of these separately. I think I created confusion last meeting by grouping them together, even though they were somewhat similar. Um, first one is a letter from Elizabeth Holman, Superintendent of Schools, Safety Light, at Brackett Elementary School that was provided to us by Mr. Feeney. Move receipt. Okay. Confirm to TAC or to uh, yeah. Mr. Feeney? To Mr. Feeney. If I could, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would say you could feel fine re uh, referring it to the town manager's office. Uh, we have included this location, which is uh, ready for an installation in a grant application that we've submitted to MassDOT that would help purchase the equipment. So we would be prepared if we receive that grant to uh, proceed accordingly. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Helms? Uh, I'll second that, and just a question on, do you, do you have an idea of the time, timeline if, if this were to proceed? Uh, we have not been made aware yet of what the timeline is for uh, the grant awards, but it's a question that we've asked. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's really, um, I hope it does happen. I think it's an excellent solution. I think that shortly after I joined the board, there was a, a, a resident, a neighbor of mine, who kind of raised some of the safety issues. I know that TAC um, uh, studied that and, and made some recommendations, so this is a really you know, good, good culmination of that. And it doesn't have to be the last thing we do, but certainly, um, I'm glad to see some responsiveness there, and I'm glad for the, uh, for the superintendent's letter. Great. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, anything further? You know, I was, actually, I was going to say that. I know the TAC had looked at this and made some recommendations, especially regarding um, curb extensions being in. It wasn't, I, I was going to go back in the minutes to see if we discussed I mean, the notion of uh, uh, our, I always want to say like rapid flashing, rectangular beacon, but I know it's like 
rectangular <laughs> rapid flashing beacon. You know, uh, uh, so uh, so yeah, because I think one of the concerns is that he, he, uh, given he, the nature of that he, that street, we we just don't want to provide a false sense of security on this one. So I imagine you've had some conversations about this with folks, mean and and. And uh, we're we're solid on that. The that this is is as Mr. Hellman indicated a good first step, you know, and and, um, and that we'll do more. Mr. Fee? Sure, if I could. Thank you. So we did uh, perform an analysis of this site to make sure it would be an appropriate site okay. for one of these installations, and it was in fact the prior work done based on the analysis done by TAC that. Uh, shortened that crossing distance by increasing or introducing curb extensions that actually created much of the real estate that we would now use uh -huh. for uh, the installation of this infrastructure. So uh, prior recommendations did already result in work that improved uh, that crossing, at least temporarily, but that analysis was done before. Uh, So-called RRFBs were uh, really a tool readily available at our disposal. And one more question. So, is there anything that we are able to do in the meantime, we need to make things safer for folks? Because, I mean, as, as uh, Ms. Holman or Dr. Holman stated, I mean, it's because that the, I guess, the playground at school is not available across the street more. So, is there anything that we're doing? It's Mr. Feeney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, when there was, you know, a certain degree of, uh, for lack of a better word, the newness when the school year started and there's new people making a commute, what we were doing was having the school resource officer or other resources available from APD to help uh, sort of direct traffic in that location until all folks who frequent that location were again used to the uh, relative traffic patterns. Uh, but with that in mind, what I will note is that that particular playground project is uh, progressing quite rapidly, and we hope to have it uh, back under uh, use this fall. So this will not be uh, a particular condition uh, with respect to this increased crossing for play across the street that will persist for any uh, extended period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. If I'm not mistaken, I think I just walked by there a couple days ago. There's also um, orange crossing flags that are installed in containers across the for people can optionally use the additional additional visibility. And I appreciated that addition. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, so on a motion for receipt and referral to the town manager made by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, no, I, didn't. I said I wasn't going to combine items, but I am going to combine <laughs> items 15 and 16. I, item 15 is the special speed regulation for Broadway. Item 16 is the special speed regulation for Park Ave. And, and what we have is our, our vote. And then there is a receipt from the State Department of Transportation indicating that uh, they certified that our regulation is consistent with the public interest. Um, so I don't know if you want to add to anything on, on either one of these, Mr. Feeney. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just uh, acknowledge and thank MassDOT for the uh, expedient turnaround. Uh, I don't think we knew exactly what to expect, but we're pleasantly surprised with how quickly it was uh, reviewed. And with that, the same sort of working group of TAC members will uh, be helping to develop a plan for how we would implement this in terms of uh, the signage that will follow. Great. Thank, th thank you, Mr. Feeney. So, um, Mr. Receipt. Diggins? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I'll motion receipt, and, and I'll, I'll um, also add that that working group is having its second meeting tomorrow. No, on Thursday. On Thursday, yeah. Great. Thank you, Mr. Second. Diggins. And Mr. Hurt, thank you for the second. Any further? Uh, Mr. Helmuth? Yeah, thank, thank you to all who, who worked on this. Um, do you have an, a, a, an ideal timeline in, in mind for this? I know the working group needs to develop the plan, but um, you know, just for the public's benefit, um, what kind of time frame are we looking at potentially or range to, to have the signs down? So, Mr. Feeney? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, obviously, that's going to depend on exactly how many signs are recommended and in what location. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, the installation of signs is not uh, the most labor-intensive of tasks. Oftentimes, it's uh, 
ordering and receiving the signs that would take even longer. So uh, this is one where you know I would, if I if I had to venture a guess, not having seen uh, a proposal or a plan, it's a matter perhaps of a few months, okay, but sure. not, not really an extended uh, timeline. <coughs> Excuse me. And so for the removal of the now out of date signs, like the 35 signs. Um, will those not will, will those come down right away, or will those wait for the replacement signs to come in? Uh, that will, it, as I understand it, it could occur before the replacement signs are installed. But there are some considerations to be made there, and that'll be part of the recommendation from the working group uh, okay. formed by TAC. Good. Uh, I look forward to those recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, so the motion to receive by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. This is for items 15 and 16. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Um, we are now on to new business. Ms. Marr? No new business, thank you. Attorney Cunningham? No new business, thank you. Mr. Feeney? No new business, thank you. Mr. Diggins? Uh, Ms. Marr, if you could bring up that, 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 um, that Excel spreadsheet that I said about climatological data <laughs> regarding, no, I'm just kidding. It's just oh, it's just to say, did you know that the, 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 the latter half of September climatologically is drier than the, the, early, the beginning half? I mean, so if you were to like, pick a date that you wanted to have an event you know, and you wanted to increase the chances you know, that it would be drier, you know, want to aim for later you know, in the month rather than earlier. That's it. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd? No Mr. Helmuth? No new business. <laughs> I, I just have a couple brief things. Sorry to, to break the string. I, I, last Thursday, I had the pleasure of attending the, the Civic Academy graduation, which was right here in the chambers. Mr. Feeney uh, issued the diplomas for our attorney Cunningham was here as well. And, and uh, Joan Roman, our public information officer, has run that program. And it's uh, really a successful program that uh, a number of residents, some have been here a long time, some who haven't are just interested in learning more about the town and uh, really had some nice good conversations afterwards with the graduates. So it's uh, been a very successful program. Their comments actually I think will help us make a better program going forward. But uh, I want to thank uh, Ms. Roman for, for running that. Uh, Mr. Feeney has been heavily involved, as have all department heads. And I think it's a real good opportunity for residents to learn more about the town, see different buildings, um, meet department heads, meet um, a few elected officials. The town moderator was here. The town um, clerk participated. And, and I, w I was here uh, as, as chair. Um, second thing, I just want to alert the board, our next meeting is November 4th, and I am going to try to have a discussion that evening on, we've got some licenses out there, one for Calix Peak on Summer Street. We have two package store licenses that had been issued subject to future conditions, and we said we are gonna come back, talk about various conditions and where we go. Um, I think it's, we're gonna do that for our next meeting and so we will notify the individual recipient of, of, of these licenses and have a discussion on that. So um, that's my new business. Um, I will now take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Motion to adjourn by Mr. Helmut. Seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.